morning, everyone, and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can we please ensure that all electronic devices are on silent mode? <clears throat> I've received apologies this morning from Christina McKelvey and Alex Cole Hamilton. As neither the convener nor the deputy convener is present today, I am chairing this part of the meeting as the oldest member present. Under Rule 12.1, the standing orders require that the committee must choose a temporary convener for the meeting. Therefore, I seek a nomination for someone to chair the meeting. Um, I will nominate Mary Fee. Thank you very much. Has the committee agreed that I, Mary Fee, be appointed as temporary convener for today's meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item one today is a decision on taking business in private. Are members agreed to take item three in private today? Agreed. Agenda item two is our budget strategy phase 2019-20. to um, is an evidence session on the budget strategy and we have with us today Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland and Mark Taylor, Assistant Director, Auditor Audit Scotland. I understand, Auditor General, you wish to make a, a brief opening statement? Thank you, Convener. I'll make it brief. Um, we're very pleased to be with the committee today to discuss the changes that are being made to the budget process and what they might mean for the scrutiny of equalities and human rights outcomes. I'd like to just very briefly set out some context for you. As you know, Scotland's public finances are fundamentally changing, with new powers over borrowing and reserves, control over most income tax, and responsibility for 11 social security benefits worth over £3 billion a year. We're seeing a shift from a spending parliament to one that needs to balance spending and revenue while managing increasing complexity, uncertainty and volatility. And there's now a much greater link with uh, the economic performance of Scotland relative to the rest of the UK. These changes to the public finance mean there's a need to transform the budget process. Parliament now needs to be able to scrutinise whether the new tax and spending powers are being used in a way that's sustainable, inclusive and makes the best use of resources in achieving the government's policy goals. As Auditor General, I support parliamentary scrutiny by providing evidence-based and objective information on public spending and performance. I was also a member of the Budget Process Review Group and I fully support its recommendations. I'm pleased that these have been welcomed by Parliament and Government and work to implement the new approach from the, the next budget cycle, 2019-20, is already well underway. The recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group build on what a number of committees are already doing. The committee's own budget report last year was a good example of how a year-round continuous cycle of scrutiny might work. Fundamentally, I think this means shifting from a narrow focus on changes from year to year to a much broader look at how public money is being raised and used over time and the impact that it's having for the people of Scotland. The revised budget process looks to extend approaches like that and put them at the heart of budget scrutiny. The Budget Process Review Group recognised the contribution that the audit process makes in providing objective, independent information about the public finances, performance and value for money as part of the basket of evidence that's available to committees. As the new budget process develops, we'll make sure our work programme continues to support parliamentary scrutiny against a backdrop of increasingly shared responsibilities between the Scottish Government and the UK Government in areas like tax and social security. Changing the budget process also means changes to culture and to ways of working. We've always known it will take time to be delivered in full, with some big challenges and opportunities to work through. We're looking forward to exploring with the committee what this might mean for the work that we all do. Uh, Mark Taylor and I will do our best to answer your questions. Thank you, Thank you very much um, for that opening statement. Can I start perhaps by asking you about um, scrutiny? Because one of the things that, that we have um, questioned different witnesses about when they've come to committee is how we follow a budget line across spend. And, and that, can, that can be um, very, very difficult to, to follow the line through to, to, to see the outcome. And it's something that you pick up in paragraphs 14 and 16 of, of your report around scrutiny and, and evaluation. And, and given that equalities and human rights covers all of the portfolio areas um, and every single committee has an element of, of human rights and equalities in it, how can we ensure that the scrutiny work that, that we do on, on this committee, when we take that longer term, broader approach to scrutiny, is matched on the subject committees? I think you're absolutely right, convener, that there's no way this will work if equalities and human rights are seen as the business of this committee. It has to play through the whole budget and through the scru scrutiny work of all of the subject committees in the parliament. Um, I think there's a couple of areas we can see where this committee can play a particular role. 
Um, the first is in encouraging the government to be providing um, its budget documentation and its financial reporting, its outcomes of what it's achieved in ways that do provide more information um, on the breakdown of how it will affect on particular, particular equalities, characteristic groups, um, and how it will um, improve outcomes around human rights. Um, the National Performance Framework and the New National Outcomes is a starting point on that, but there's lots of work, I think, to do to work through what that means in practice um, with the decisions that are being proposed for how money is used and what the policy goals are. The second is probably to help the other committees to think through what good practice looks like in relation to their areas, areas of responsibility, health and social care, um, or the economy, or whatever it might be, in terms of thinking about it through an equalities and human rights lens. Um, so guidance for them, questions that you're interested in having answered, your ability to join up the dots across different portfolios, where that's what's going to make a difference to equalities and human rights. So is the, the breakdown, is that probably the most important aspect? of it because quite often you see the, the top line and there'll be a there'll be a one letter description of what the budget spend is but the underlying figures beneath that the breakdown of those figures will pick out the human rights so is that the most important aspect of it um, I think that's one important aspect, and I'll ask Mark to talk about that in a moment. I think the other one is probably um, the broader equalities dimension, particularly when we're talking about tax and social security powers, um, that the government has been um, has made a good start on its proposals around income tax, on setting out the impact that it expects its proposals to have um, on people who are less well-off, people who are, who are better off. But there's more to do in terms of things like distributional analysis to look at the impact of tax changes, um, council tax changes, all of those sorts of areas of policy on equalities in terms of um, income and poverty rather than the protected characteristics. Mark, do you want to pick up the other part of the question? On, on information in the budget itself and individual budget lines, uh, as, as the committee will be aware, there are, of course, a small number of budget lines that are directly linked to activity and uh, qualities and human rights areas, and obviously there's a, an area for inquiry about that, but the vast bulk of impact, the vast bulk of the way in which the budget has an effect on those areas is through all of the budget and through all of the budget lines. And there's something here about uh, as the shift to the new approach to scrutiny widens out perspectives, there's something that rather than looking more narrowly at the information on individual lines, that there's a broader look taken about in particular policy areas and overall what's the overall impact on, on, on outcomes and what's the overall impact on some of the main initiatives and programmes within uh, the government spending programme. I think one of the things that the Budget Process Review Group recommended that we'd hope to see some uh, progress on in, 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 in early course is that when, a, when the government comes with a, a new initiative or new programme that's able to articulate more clearly what the implications for a range of outcomes are in those, that particular programme and therefore in those new programmes we would expect a part of that to be about equalities and human rights and articulating what the impact in those areas are and that provides a locus for individual committees and for yourself to get more of a sense of where's the money going and what's it what's it buying us and what what are the what's the impact and likely implications of that mm. thank, thank you for that Gail thank you convener um good morning <coughs> this might be quite a wide-ranging question um but what do you think that we're getting right at the moment in terms of equalities and human rights budgeting? I'd say um, one of the biggest things going for us is the national performance framework and the outcomes approach. I think that's, that's a really good framework for taking that longer term view. Um, the longer term view is absolutely central to the recommendations the Budget Process Review Group made. Um, and it provides a good um, starting point for saying, OK, if, if our aims are about making Scotland a great place for children and young people to grow up, and a key policy is to increase the amount of early um, learning and childcare that we provide, which are the groups within that that matter most? Is our priority about helping more parents back to work, particularly more mothers? Um, is it about giving um, a, an extra helping hand to children from the most deprived families? Um, and then thinking through how we're going to allocate the money to um, reflect that and how we'll know that it's happening. So my sense is that having the outcomes there is a really good starting point. Um, beyond that, I think the challenge is about getting the information in place to, to be able to tell um, actually what progress we're making 
rather than having to wait um, 10 years or a generation to be able to see the outcome. The outcome is what matters, but we can't wait 20 years to know if we're moving in the right direction or not. So having a bit more of that information and making it more possible for all of the committees of Parliament to um, look at next year's budget proposals in the context of what we're trying to achieve and whether we're heading in the right direction, I think would be a really good uh, next step to make. I could just add, add something to that. I guess on the process side, the other, I think, strength of the arrangements that we have at the moment is the role that the Equalities uh, uh, and Budgeting Advisory Group plays as an advisor to government. It gives a locus, a centre of expertise, can't do all the work, and unable to do all the work itself, but is able to work both with government and indeed uh, previously with the committee uh, around what are the issues here and help to explore those issues. And I think that the role that that group plays is really uh, an important role in moving forward uh, uh, the, the, the information requirements and how to address those information requirements. I think the information that comes with the, the, the budget at the moment is a good, uh, and that the qualities analysis is, is, is an early step, and there's so much more to do there. And I think the work that the, the, the group does with government and the work done in government to widen out the range of analysis around uh, qualities and the effect on, uh, on different, different groups uh, is really important part of where we need to go next. Okay, thank you. Um, Auditor General, you've obviously got a locus to look at the public bodies and where the, the public spend is going. From our point of view, if we're going to follow the, the public pound, as Mary Fee mentioned, a lot of that money goes to local authorities and then they have free, well, sort of free reign to spend it how they think is best. How do we make sure that they're fulfilling their equalities and human rights um, in, in regards to budgeting? Um, it's a really good question and I think it's related to the one that the convener kicked off with about the difficulty of understanding what's happening below the, the sort of high level lines in the budget. Um, it's clearly the case that um, local authorities are directly elected bodies in their own right. They've got statutory powers and a general um, well-being power. So their ability to act in ways that they believe will further the needs of their community is very important. And they're doing that within the overall framework of the national performance framework and the national outcomes. So they all produce local outcome improvement plans, which set out what, what the needs of their area are and how they're planning to improve them over time. Um, I think there is scope um, for local authorities to get sharper at the way they're engaging with people about that and then communicating the progress they're making. Um, the role of audit, though, I think is very much um, a, a bit of the evidence that's available to the Parliament and to this committee about the way they're picking up equalities, um, as well as the annual audit, um, which happens for all public bodies in Scotland. Under the auspices of the Accounts Commission, um, local authorities also undergo a review of the progress they're making on best value, the best value duty they have. One of the characteristics of best value at the moment in the statutory guidance is equalities. Um, and the auditors look at, um, first of all, what the council say they're doing, and secondly, the progress that they're making in doing that, and come to a judgment about whether it is based on a proper understanding of the needs of the local people and whether they're doing the right things from there. Um, and I'm thinking through a couple of the best value audits that have happened so far. Um, in Glasgow, for example, um, the council had made a real focus on transport as a priority on the basis that transport was very important for people um, from outlying areas of Glasgow, potentially more deprived areas, to be able to get to work, to education, um, to the other things the city has to offer, and was doing that in a way that was very much focused both on equalities and human rights. Um, Renfrewshire, I think, was very much focused on poverty as being um, one of the things that it felt it needed to address to meet the needs of the people in in the area. Um, so it's picked up in, in that way rather than what are you doing about equalities? Do you understand what um, promoting equalities would look like in your area and can you show us that you're making progress towards that? Excellent. <coughs> Just a, a follow-up point on that last question that, that, that Gail Ross asked because we have some information from local authorities on, on how they assess um, the work that they are doing on equalities and, and, and human rights. <coughs> And, and some specifically mention human rights and equalities in the budget work that they do. Some say they're community-based, so they automatically do human rights and, and, and equalities work. Is there a role somewhere for COSLA to, to have more of an influence um, or a supporting role mm -hmm. in how local authorities carry out the scrutiny work and make sure the spend goes in the right direction? 
I start with the caveat that um, local authorities aren't within my area of responsibility. Um, but my personal view is that I think probably COSLA um, can be doing more to help um, each local authority around Scotland think about how they apply the broad duty that applies to them, as it does to all public bodies, to their particular circumstances. Um, and, and moving on from the sense that, um, it, yes, of course, if you're focusing on your community, you're going to pick up um, equalities and human rights to some extent. But I think it's very easy for all of us to, to take that for granted and not be thinking about the people who are less visible or less vocal um, and whose interests are therefore easier to miss when you're thinking about the most important things in your area. So I think something about guidance, something about applying the same principles that are now being built into the Scottish Government's budget about understanding the impact of your budget decisions on the different groups locally and thinking through all of your policy decisions through an equality and human rights lens. What does our housing policy mean for human rights, for equalities? Um, what about our support for the local economy? Those sorts of questions are all the way that I'd expect people to be explicitly um, considering equalities and human rights duties. Okay, thank you. Oliver. Thank you, convener. Um, I want to start just by asking about money that uh, is received by third sector organisations who obviously play a vital role in delivering a number of services and particularly uh, when it comes to promoting equalities and, and, and human rights. Do you uh, sort of uh, put, put any focus into analysing whether that money delivers best uh, value um, and what, what, what sort of analysis uh, do you do? Um, again, I think a lot of that question relates to local authorities rather than to, to the bodies that are directly in, in my remit, given the scale of third sector funding that um, local authorities provide. Um, uh, sorry to, to interrupt, you're just interested mm -hmm. in money particularly that's received directly by organisations from, from the Scottish from Government. The government, okay. Um, they they um, tend to come into the audit remit as part of our look at a particular policy. Um, so we've looked recently, for example, at self-directed support um, and looking at the way in which um, the government, as well as the other public bodies involved in that policy, are engaging with um, third sector organisations, first of all, to understand some of the views of the people who are affected by or depend on that service, um, and then the way in which that's actually shaping the government's policy decisions about um, how money is spent. Um, that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing uh, goes back to the point that Mark was making about planning for outcomes um, within the budget. If um, a particular policy area is focused on, um, it is, uh, will require to be delivered in partnership with third sector organisations or indeed private sector providers to be very clear about that, to be clear about the sort of relationship that um, is needed to do it, about the flow of funds and, and back to the point of knowing what progress is being made, what's working and what's not. So it tends to be through the, um, the looking through the direction of an individual policy rather than relationship with third sector bodies overall, but where it's rather than yes, we look at it. Okay, no, that's uh, helpful. I was interested as well in the comments you made around looking at outcomes. Do you feel, and I know that, that all governments naturally look for the positive outcomes in, in policies, do you feel that enough focus is given to to, to sort of setting out uh, the relevant data in relation to possible alternatives, but also uh, unintended uh, consequences of policies? I think it's a really important question, and in a sense, I think the answer is the same one as to Ms. Ross's question earlier. Um, I think it, unless we've got um, very clear um, measures and milestones that we expect to see on, on the way to improving an outcome over time, it's very hard to know what's working and what's not. And if you don't know what's not working, you can't um, decide to stop doing that and instead invest the money in doing something else instead. Um, at the moment, I think there is, it's difficult politically to stop doing things, but beyond that, I think it's also difficult to see which are the things that are not working as well, and therefore you should consider doing less of so that you can do more of the things that are working. Um, I think they're all things that you need to be doing well before you get to the point where you would expect to see an improvement in the overall outcome that you're looking to achieve. And 
do you do you think specifically that the government set out enough information on the alternatives that they've considered as part of the policy making process to allow proper scrutiny? I would say that's patchy. Um, I'll, I'll refer back, for example, to the work we published earlier this year on early learning and childcare. Um, and we found that back in 2014, when the original decision to expand um, the entitlement was made, the government wasn't clear about what options it had considered and why it chose the one that it had done. That meant that it wasn't possible to demonstrate actually which was the outcome that you thought you were going to achieve, whether it was helping more parents into employment or helping to reduce inequality between children from the poorest families um, and the rest. Um, so in that case, we, we felt that the government hadn't done enough, certainly to set out um, the things that it had considered and decided not to do. Um, in other instances, I think there's more evidence of that. So it's patchy, but there's room for improvement. Good. Around, around how how to get at that question, uh, one of the things that I think we're quite clear about is that in measuring outcomes, there's something about it not just being a single figure for the whole of the population. That's the reference point. There's something about the ability to understand what the outcomes are for different people and different groups within the population. And uh, really pleased to see the government's commitment within its new national performance framework to, as far as possible, break down those outcome, uh, outcomes data to enable a geographic analysis, to enable an analysis amongst different interest groups. Now, there's a lot of work to do for that to actually happen but I think in, in, in assessing outcomes it's not just the aggregate number that matters it's that granularity and that's that sense of what the impact on different people across the country are which will be really important. Yes, thank you for that that leads me uh, nicely on to my final question which was just around sort of distributional analysis and uh, how, how policies affect individuals do you think that that's something that's done at the start of the process or uh, do, do you think that I mean, my perception certainly is that sometimes it's a sort of add-on at the end that's used to, to justify a policy position that's already been arrived at. Do you think that the government start with the analysis or do you think they start with a policy intention and, and work backwards? So I think, I think there's a variety of practice and I think that's part of the issue. I think what's clear is that approach to distributional analysis needs to be much more rigorous, systematic and built in across the piece. Uh, I don't think it's a straightforward thing to do. I think there's a lot of work that's required to enable government to get there and to be able to do that and to enable other public bodies, councils, to be able to begin to do that. I think the approach is to, to pick some areas uh, where, where, where uh, there's a greater understanding uh, already there and build on that. And, and more generally, as information needs are addressed and things are uh, information requirements are improved and there's better data, there's something about the... The, the, the nature of that being an incremental process, you know, there's not a, there's not a magic bullet to suddenly create a whole uh, basket of information, but there's a need to quicken the pace of change, the need to quicken uh, the, the ability to do that more routinely as part of the policy making process, and critically as part of the budget scrutiny process to support the budget scrutiny about an assessment of what impact is public spending and public revenue raising having. Where you say pick areas. Um I mean, what, what, what areas would you identify as, you know, with, with, with the, that are currently, you know, a, a strength? So, so, so I, I'd, I'd hesitate to identify specific areas that I felt were a strength. I think, I think there are areas where the thinking is more advanced around gender, for example, uh, and, and those sort of areas provide a good starting point. I think I'd struggle to identify areas where there's comprehensive information available currently. Thank you. Just before I bring in um, Annie Wells, I, w I wanted to ask an, an additional question to Mark Taylor around the national performance framework, because when you spoke about um, measuring the outcomes and, and broadening it out to get a, a, a broader look at how, how we're doing, we measure the NPF through indicators. So is the, the crucial piece of work to be done is to develop and expand the indi indicators to be almost quite specific in, in what they're looking for to prove that we're fulfilling the obligations and we're meeting targets and so, so the commitment from government as I understand it, is to take that new indicator set which of course has just recently been agreed and look to try and break them down so the individual headline indicators to look to try and break them down in both a geographic manner and across particular aspects of the community <laughs> and they've identified some priorities for doing that that's that's a commitment I think there's a lot of work uh, still to to be done to, to make that the case. And, and do you know if they will break it down into all all the different equality um, kind of bits of the budget, 
or will it be a, a very kind of broad range when, when, when they look at that? So I think so far we know the commitment. Uh -huh. I think I think we, we wait to see the, the, the detail, the, of, the detail that. of that. Yeah. Right, okay. And I would expect it to be different for different outcomes, so that some are going to be relevant to um, the, the protected characteristics, some will be relevant by age, others will be much more relevant by geography. It may not be the, the same set for every outcome, I would guess. Right, okay, yeah. thank you. Anne. Thank you, convener, and good morning. I've got a couple of questions, and it was just about the public engagement you've mentioned in, the, in your submission. Obviously, public engagement is it's a huge thing, and as a committee, we try and actually go out there and, and sort of a, be with the, the general public, people that are hard to reach. How can other committees and how can we as a parliament make sure that we're engaging the public in this budget process, especially when we look at the equality impact assessments that we know should and do happen, but we have been told by local authorities that sometimes these maybe aren't as effective as, as they could be. It's it's basically a tick box, ex tick, tick box exercise. So how do we encourage the public to believe that we are doing scrutiny properly when we've got local authorities there saying that that's not always the, the case? Um, I think the first thing I'd say is that although I think Parliament's got a really important role in that, actually the primary responsibility should sit with government and with local authorities to be engaging themselves with people about what matters to them, um, within that what works and what doesn't, um, what, their, what, their, what, what their preferences are. Um, we know that the Community Empowerment Act gives um, specific responsibilities to local authorities to do that. Um, the Accounts Commission's Best Value Work has shown a range of approaches to going about it um, but actually I think it's hard to, to say so far that it's really having a, a sort of fundamental effect on the way that local authorities decide how to spend the budgets that they have every year um, and I think it's something that if, if that consultation about what the budget proposals look like is done well, it's much easier for committees of the Parliament to be hearing from people about whether that's effective or not, whether they feel their voices are being heard, whether they see changes to the services that are being provided or the way that's being done. So you might want to think about um, doing a bit of a, a dual focusing of listening to people about what matters to them, but then asking um, the uh, government and COSLA or councils how, how they're responding to that, what they're doing about it. Because the only, you said Glasgow had done a, a really good piece when they looked at transport, but obviously we've seen recently as well that with the early years information and, and the sort of a rise in cause, to me it doesn't look as if we're, we're putting the equality impact assessment right on everything. Um, and again, it's how do we, because we, we as a committee, we are looking at a human rights based approach to, to everything. So how can we, I suppose, disseminate that to the councils to say that this is what we are trying to do and be guarantors? And how, how can we actually not tell the councils what to do, but just sort of a show best practice? I think two things spring to mind for me, and Mark may have um, something to add. First of all, I think the convener's question about COSLA is a really important one. Um, I think the more that um, the, com the committee and COSLA together are saying, this is what good looks like, the easier councils will find it to um, get to grips with something which can be quite complex and, and not, not people can be not sure where to start. So I think that's really important. The second is that I think all of the committees of parliament have got really um, a really important role in um, acting as a sort of amplifier for the concerns that you all hear as MSPs from your constituents um, and, and the people in your regions. Um, if, if you're hearing that um, a particular policy is not working well for people in your patch, your ability to play that through the parliamentary scrutiny process and increasingly the budget process, I think is, has got a lot of influence on what the government and what local councils will do about it. Um, so it may not be in the case of councils a direct line of saying, we expect you to do this, um, this particular thing, but it is a way of saying we do expect you to be um, taking your equalities and human rights duty seriously, and here is what we think that would look like. Okay, thank you. Fulton. <coughs> yeah, thanks, convener. Um, it's just quite a general question, actually. Just, just wondering how you would consider budget scrutiny uh, in terms of human rights levers, where there may be major policy differences between governments. And I think the example you actually gave at the start was um, what actually prompted my question. If you look around welfare, where the UK government may be taking one approach and the Scottish government another, generally speaking, but at the end of the day, it's the same folk that are affected. Um, how, how would that play in? 
I think this is one of the areas that we're um, focusing on most in terms of our own work at the moment. Um, until quite recently, under the devolution settlement, it was pretty straightforward that if a matter wasn't reserved to the UK government, it was a matter for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish government, and we audited what, what was therefore um, devolved. Um, what we're now seeing um, with the devolution of income tax powers, um, social security, and coming along soon VAT, is a much more sort of wavy line between the responsibilities of the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament. Um, and we're um, working hard with our colleagues in the National Audit Office to think about how we can um, do our work in a way that's proportionate, that doesn't lead to loads of duplication, but does satisfy both parliaments that um, their interests are um, being protected and they're getting the assurance they need about the way public money is being spent. So if we stick with um, social, social Security as an example, um, there's no question but that um, the uh, National Audit Office will continue to audit the DWP as a UK public body. And there's no question that the Scottish Parliament has got a real interest in some aspects of what DWP does because it will be providing um, elements of the devolved social security benefits to people in Scotland, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, so we're working through what that means and also looking at the way the Scottish Government is um, handling the um, transfer of those powers to Scotland um, to make sure that it's doing it in a way that um, manages the risks to some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland, that is letting it use its powers in the way that, in, that it intends to, um, and that is um, ensuring a sort of smooth landing which provides a basis for the next level of powers and the um, freedom to introduce new benefits that, that comes on stream at the same time. Now, we are still working our way through it, but I, I expect it to be a matter of continuing interest to Parliament and obviously the, the equalities and human rights dimension of that is something that we take seriously as I know that you do. So, so it would be fair to say that this is a, a, an ongoing area well, uh, for you. Sure, yeah. 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 and a complicated yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Gail, did you have a supplementary on that? Yeah, I do. Um, thanks, convener. It just follows on actually from Fulton's question. Um, in your evidence uh, at the very end, you raised some concerns about the draft audit and accountability framework, and I, is that specifically in relation to the social security and tax powers, or is that overall? Um, it, it is. It's it's being framed in a way that would cover anything else that ends up being um, devolved or shared in that way. Um, but obviously, it's specifically driven at the moment around the tax and the social security powers that are the ones we're um, implementing at the moment. So what specifically are the concerns that you have and how can we address those concerns? Um, well, just to give you one example, um, at the moment, um, under the legislation, income tax is almost fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament um, in terms of the rates and the bans, um, but it has to be collected by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and that's not a choice the Scottish Government has in the way it is for Social Security. It's baked into the legislation. Um, now, uh, HMRC is audited by my colleagues in the National Audit Office, and they've done that for a very long time. It's a big, complex audit, and there are particular safeguards around it to protect taxpayer confidentiality. So I've got no access to HMRC at all. But we know that income tax revenues will be about £12 billion this year. Um, they will be a big chunk of Scotland's um, revenues, the amount of money it's got to spend in future. And I think it's entirely appropriate for the Scottish Parliament to have an interest, um, not just that the amounts of money being um, recorded and therefore transferred to Scotland are right, but that um, Scottish taxpayers are being treated um, to the same standards of customer care as UK taxpayers on the whole are, um, that tax evasion and fraud in relation to Scotland is being tackled seriously so that losses are minimised. Um, and yet at the moment I can't provide any direct assurance to Parliament about that. So the draft framework is about working through how um, the existing audit arrangements are maintained and protected while still giving me enough access to provide that, that assurance to the Scottish Parliament that its interests are being looked after and that if there are any problems it knows that and can follow them up. And that's a tricky thing. Oliver, did you have another question? Uh, yes, it was just a brief question. I mean, obviously, uh, you're talking of an expanding remit um, and lots of hard work ongoing to change the, the current budgetary process. Do you think that enough resource and priority is being given uh, to enable that work? 
I think so far the early signs are positive. Um, certainly in Audit Scotland we were very pleased to see the medium-term financial strategy published last month. That's the first time that's happened in Scotland. Contained a lot of information about the revenue side, room for more development on the expenditure side, but a great first step. Um, we have got the um, written agreement now between Parliament and Government um, and we have the expectation that that will come into play for the 2019-20 budget. Um, we've always known this was something that would have to evolve over time. It's, it's, you can't do a big bang and make it work. I think for me the challenge is keeping the momentum up so that we see some of the developments we've been talking about this morning, like having more information in the budget about uh, that links um, expenditure proposals to outcomes, that breaks it down by different equalities groups, for example, or by um, the, uh, the people who are expected to be particularly affected by a policy proposal. And all of that will take time at a time when people are already very busy and resources are tight. Um, so I'm um, committed to keeping on um, playing our part in that, but also reporting to Parliament about what I think the progress has been in doing it and highlighting any particular concerns that feel as though we might be at risk of um, losing some of the potential that's there. Do you want to add to that, Mark? We uh, did a piece of work earlier in the year around uh, progress with implementing the whole range of Scotland Act powers. And one of the findings in that piece of work was around the capacity challenges that government have got. So it is a whole new uh, set of responsibilities in addition to the government's continuing responsibilities and other, uh, other current issues at the moment. And it's a real stretch for government to be able to respond to that. And we highlighted some issues around that in our, in our, in our last report. I think the sense is that uh, the initial changes have been well resourced. Uh, particularly around social security and there's been some good initial progress around that but there's a, a massive job ahead and those capacity changes have the risk of beginning to bite as, 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 as the work continues. Thank you. Thank you um, Oliver. C can I perhaps um, c come back to some of the points that you make in your submission around, um, I'm thinking about the basket of evidence, when you, when you talk about um, the availability of um, quality data and, and it's something that comes up time and time again when we, when we take evidence, and, and it comes it comes out in evidence across other committees that the, the one the lack of reliable data, and the lack of the use of the data that, that that's available. What what can be done to ensure that data is used across all of the committees and across all of the work that government does to help us to actually measure outcomes? Um, I, I'll start by talking about what we can do with the, the data that's already there and then maybe ask Mark to pick up the question of the gaps that, that we know exist and that are becoming increasingly important. Um, I think in some ways it comes back to this idea that if you're taking an outcomes approach, everything that every public body does should be aiming towards those and they should all know what contribution they're, they're expecting to make. That's not to say it will always work as planned, which is why you need to be measuring progress and shifting, but you should know why you're doing something and how you'll know whether it's working or not. At the moment, it can be quite hard for, for us, for you, for anyone to join the dots if we think about something like um, sustainable economic growth. Um, we reported on um, the... Um, the, econ the economy agencies, if you like, um, a year or so ago um, and found that while the economic strategy was clear about the things it wanted to achieve, it was much harder to see what Scottish Enterprise and High and Skills Development Scotland and the other bodies involved were doing themselves that was making a difference there. Um, I think that's part of the reasoning behind the new um, Strategic Enterprise and Skills Board. Um, but there's a real job of work to do um, for government and its public bodies to start with of helping helping you to see how they expect all of those things to be working together and how money is following those plans year by year to get there. Um, all of the public bodies, as well as the government themselves, produce a plan and an annual report. There's room for those to do much more to tell you about um, what they're trying to achieve in the context of the outcomes and then to sort of close the loop by telling you what progress they're making. Um, audit reports can be part of that. We report on each individual body each year as well as the planned programme of performance audit works um, which come through the Public Audit Committee to Parliament and do look at specific issues. Some of those are very specifically about equalities or human rights issues um, like the work on self-directed support. We're planning some work on housing, on children and young people's mental health services. They can help to to sort of pull that picture together and show you how it's working. Um, and then I think your own clerks and the, the um, people in SPICE are increasingly skilled in, in helping you to pull the picture together from what's already there. Now, we know there are still some gaps, but I think doing, doing that, pulling together, is a good first step. Mark? 
I'd observe that the, the shift to the new budget process is one of those opportunities to find you know, how to encourage people to make more use of the data that's already there, and that's at the heart of the budget recommendations, the budget process recommendations, that give, giving Parliament the time and space, but also giving public bodies and the government more of an opportunity to articulate what they're doing and, for, and find a home for that within the budget uh, process as an ongoing process, building up information over time. So the shift to the budget process, I think, helps. I think there is a real responsibility, as the Auditor General says, on government and public bodies to articulate better their plans, what difference those plans will make and how they expect that uh, to have a difference and how they are then delivering against those plans and what difference uh, the policies are making in practice. There's a real opportunity, I think, within uh, annual reporting to be clearer about the difference that individual components uh, of, of the public sector are making to outcomes. And again, there's a commitment uh, within the budget process review, the recommendations and acceptance of recommendations, that there's stronger guidance from government to public bodies about their ability to do that. And I think that builds up the information base and builds up the, the, the dialogue between uh, people who are delivering public services and the dif uh, and Parliament about the difference that that's making. Uh, and the shift to the new budget process is a really important part of that. Beyond that, there's specific equalities and uh, uh, human rights data. And with the data strategy that's in place and the opportunity to, to build on what's there, but to continue to look for, uh, for how those improvements of particular data sets can be made. And of course, as I've mentioned before, the commitment under the National Performance Framework to have that more granular information. So, so, there's, so there's, there's the will, there's the, the, the ambition to have much better data. It's not a case that we go from not having good data to flicking a switch and obviously having perfect data. It's about the continued effort to be able to do that, uh, a prioritised, focused effort. And, and I suppose two, two things occur to me following on from what you said. One is how we join all of that together. Given all of that's there, we need to find a way to join it together and to, to continue to keep it joined together so that we can properly interrogate budget. But I suppose um, the, the other thing, that there, there is a role across committees when, when they're scrutinising budget to perhaps look at it through a different lens. Because and, and I'm not saying that we tend to ask the same questions all the time when we, we scrutinise budget, but there is a kind of element of we'll ask this, we'll ask this and we'll ask that. But maybe committees need to be a bit more um, focused on the questions that they're asking to get the answer that they require to do their scrutiny work. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I th so, so I think, I think that, that the essence of the shift in the new budget process is to enable all committees to take a broader look at how public money in their area has been used and indeed raised and what difference that's making. Within that, there's an opportunity for committees to decide what its, their priorities are and to select some particular areas of focus to be able to explore that. One of the challenges for all committees and for this committee is how to ensure that that, that focus includes an examination of equalities and human rights as part of that focus. Clearly, all committees can't do everything, and there's something about how that uh, uh, is one of the lenses, to use the language of the Auditor General, that committees are using when they're thinking about particular policy areas. I think rather than focusing on budget lines or focusing on particular uh, 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 sets of data and particular uh, individual questions, it's an opportunity for committees to say, in our area, we need to focus on this particular thing, city deals perhaps. We focus on this particular thing. Now, what what's, what is difference are city deals making? What are the implications of the city deals investment? What are the implications for equalities and human rights of the city deals investment? And use that kind of general policy inquiry, budget inquiry around the spend around, in that case, city deals, and what the different uh, outcomes uh, to consider are as a result of that particular area. I think that's the thinking behind the shift to the new, the, the new budget process and to allow opportunities, more opportunities for committees to do that and more opportunities for committees to hear from people and interest groups around what it means for them in particular uh, investment areas and particular policy areas. Uh, sorry. Sorry, can I that? The only thing I was going to add to what Marcus said is I think the shift to doing that on a year-round basis provides the chance to be more um, planned and thoughtful about what are the particular areas that each committee is interested in and for the 
conveners and clerks to consult with other committees about what matters. So, for example, if the Economy Committee was looking at city deals as a key theme in their budget scrutiny, um, they've got time to plan that over um, the year rather than just sort of six weeks around Christmas when the budget um, process was, has formally been underway. Um, and to, to talk to this committee about if we're doing that, what are the equalities aspects that we might be interested in? What questions would you like us to follow through? And you can think of other examples for all the committees, but it, it allows that step back rather than the whistle ble being blown at the end of November and then a hard stop date in February, which is where we've all been so far. You've, you've pre-empted the question I was about to ask, um, because my question was, is there then a role for this committee to, to be almost quite specific in saying to other committees, we want you to look at a particular aspect? Mm. I absolutely yeah. think so. I think this committee is the one that builds up that expertise and understanding of what equalities and human rights mean in, in practical terms, in terms of the choices that are being made about where the money is spent and how you'll know what the effect is there. Um, you will have views from your own roles on other committees and um, as MSPs about where that might be working well, but where there are real questions to ask. You've talked today about early learning and childcare and, and other things. And to um, find a mechanism through the conveners group, through the finance committee's role, um, through the, the clerks, to be playing that in early to shape what other committees do, I think has got the potential to lift the whole parliamentary budget scrutiny to a, a new level. The, the other thing I wanted to pick up on was the point you make in your submission about the reviewing the focus and coverage of the equality budget statement. Now, I know you've, you've particularly in Mark Taylor, you've spoken a lot about how we expand it, how we expand the, the, the indicators that we use, how we join everything together. Is what you've described this morning what you want to see when, when they the renew the focus on the equality budget statement? Broadly, yes. I think, I think part, part of that is is again with a shift the whole year approach, taking the uh, narrowness of the focus of, of the draft budget and the equalities budget statement being uh, uh, attached entirely to that and trying to open up opportunities to have more reporting throughout the year, earlier reporting on some of the distributional effects and some of the, the analysis that, that, that is, that's under development. And so that rather than it all being focused in a single document at a single time, it's part of an ongoing effort to, to have data and have information. Um, do you want to come in? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, convener. Um, Auditor General, in your written submission, um, you. Oh, no, sorry, this is something else. That was the written submission there. Um, can you tell us a bit about the um, internal diversity and equality steering group? that you have in Audit Scotland? Scotland, yes. Yeah. Um, like all public bodies, we're covered by the diversity and equality duties. Um, we've got a diversity um, and equality steering group, as you say, that's chaired by one of our assistant directors, one of Mark's um, close colleagues, um, that brings together people from across um, Audit Scotland, the people delivering financial audit, performance audit, and our corporate services, um, to look at our two equalities outcomes, which are, first of all, about the way we address um, equalities and human rights through all of our audit work, and secondly, how, as an employer and an organisation, we meet our own responsibilities. Um, and it um, has um, set out a number of actions, an action plan for how we go about that, um, which are really to do with, um, in terms of our audit work, making sure that we're consulting widely um, with uh, stakeholders with an interest in these issues on the overall approach we take to our work. And as part of that, we have our own Equalities and Human Rights Advisory Group that the Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission sits on that when we are um, developing the planned work programme, that we, again, are consulting very widely on that. And once we've selected a piece of work, uh, looking at something like housing or children and young people's mental health, we're consulting directly or as directly as we can with the people affected by those services. Um, we've got um, continuing strands of work, like working with young Scots, um, to um, hear from young people themselves about what matters to them to inform that work programme. Um, when we're carrying out the audit work, we engage with people to get their views through focus groups and through um, surveys, through social media, those sorts of things. And then when we're reporting it, we think quite hard about the particular audience that this piece of work um, we want to be of interest to um, and how we can reach them. So for the work on early learning and childcare, we put together a very short video that, that um, let parents know about their entitlements um, and um, pointed them towards a sort of checklist of things that they, they should be asked 
asking when they're considering um, what's the right solution for their child. So we try to do that for every piece of work where it makes sense, and it's our diversity and equalities group that um, oversees that. We also produce an annual um, report on diversity that fulfills our duties under the Act um, and that covers the, the broad way in which we go about that. Thanks. Um, sorry, it was a submission to our human rights inquiry that you put in in April. Um, and it says that you're currently exploring how you might extend the remit to include consideration of human rights and social economic inequality. How far along is that piece of work, do you know? Um, it, it's in progress still. Um, like you, we find human rights a bit trickier to get to grips with than, than equalities, if you think of them as two different things. Um, we've got a very... Um, one of our um, newly qualified auditors has got a legal background and a very strong interest in human rights, and she's working with the diversities group to think about how we take that forward. Um, we think probably the starting point will be about specific pieces of work rather than trying to apply it to everything in the same fashion. Um, and a good example is the work we're planning over the next couple of years on housing, um, where there's obviously a very big human rights dimension to that and thinking about how we pick it up. Mark, do you want to add to that? I think, I think the only thing I'd add to that, that uh, uh, the Auditor General talked about the consultation that we do, and we have our, our own group set up, a Equalities and Human Rights Advisory Group, which is around 20 organisations across the range of equalities interests, and human rights being an important part of that advisory group. And one of the early actions we've taken is to build in, build in that aspect to that advisory group. Is, is that steering group specifically looking at the issue of um, gender in relation to um, unpaid care, if you like, because there, there is huge disparity in, in the amount of um, women and men that, that are unpaid carers and, and, and lose out on all sorts of things because they are carers? Mm -hmm. It's the sort of thing that, that we would um, be picking up through the advisory group that Mark's talked about and then say, OK, if that's an issue, how does it apply to the particular um, pieces of work that we're planning at the moment? Um, if I think through um, the work we've done recently, um, probably the closest to that has been um, the early learning and childcare one. Um, but it's, it's easy to think of other pieces of work where that could be a very important um, driver. Um, and actually, I think the work that we're planning now about the way in which the government is picking up its plans to um, stimulate the economy to make the use of the tax powers, that's going to be a very big um, dimension of it, as well as the broader um, work that we have underway about care of older people. People. And will that st will the steering group take account of the, the universal periodic review and take on board um, some of the recommendations from that and will also look at the concluding observations? Um, I would say yes in principle. I can't put my hand on my heart and say that we're on that at the moment. It's one of the things that plays in from the advisory group with those 20-odd organisations into our own work planning and the way we run the organisation. But I think it's an action point for us to take away to make sure we've got that covered. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members? In that case, can I thank um, both of you for coming along this morning and um, giving us um, your evidence. I think it's been a very useful and a very interesting session for, for, for all of us. Um, I'm now going to suspend the meeting for five minutes for a brief comfort break before we move into private session. Thank you.